Thank you very much. Um, thanks all for joining today. So uh, the title of my talk is The State of the Art in Angiography uh, or Non-Invasive uh, Coronary Physiology. My disclosures are just research support. So my objectives uh, are, I first want to talk about a brief history of coronary angiography. This is a story that spans about uh, 70 years. The development of QFR and then validation studies, uh, which then lead to outcome studies. In terms of background, coronary angiography is the gold standard for assessing the anatomic severity of coronary artery stenosis. But inter-observer agreement of uh, stenosis severity is low. Intermediate severity stenoses by angiography may or may not be associated with angina or objective evidence of reversible ischemia. And this is important because nearly half of intermediate severity stenoses are not physiologically significant. And PCI to these lesions does not improve outcomes and may actually lead to worse outcomes. Like I said, the story spans, um, uh, you know, uh, 50 to 70 years. And so um, I'm going to start my talk uh, first with uh, coronary angiography. Then I'll talk about wire-based methods, um, including fractional flow reserve, non hyperemic pressure ratios, and then uh, the state of the art with uh, quantitative flow ratio. The first coronary, angiogra uh, coronary angiogram was performed in 1958 at the Cleveland Clinic. This was an accidental injection of a right coronary artery by Mason Soans. Um, and it was really the first time that in humans we, we realized that we could do angiograms uh, and, and actually make decisions based on these. Over the uh, next 20 years, um, uh, we started to say, how do we quantify a stenosis? And so um, QCA was developed and published in uh, uh, 1977. So the first um, QCA publication took uh, a coronary angiogram and standardized views, and then created uh, a three-dimensional reconstruction based on a number of assumptions. So if you look at this example, they would take an LAO and an RAO of a vessel, then uh, they would take these film-based angiograms um, and make these flat reconstructions. They would presume that the vessel had an elliptical shape, and then based on this, try to uh, extrapolate a diameter stenosis and an area stenosis. Um, and so on the left, you see this um, uh, figure of a vessel that's normal, and then they actually uh, looked at people with vasospasm, and this is a spasmed artery, and they tried to calculate the actual diameter and area stenosis. If you look at um, work by uh, names that are, are really um, uh, well known to us in uh, interventional cardiology, um, this uh, premise that when we look at coronary angiograms with our eyes, we can be misled uh, was very clear. So um, uh, Maria Schlump uh, read this, led this study uh, of inter and intra observer variability in the interpretation of coronary angiograms. They had three interpreters uh, at three different time points looking at coronary angiograms and then assessing the diameter stenosis. And what they found is that there's about 15% variability when you go from uh, uh, measurement to measurement. And so that creates a lot of uncertainty when you're actually trying to make a decision, uh, especially in terms of guiding a treatment like a PCI. So uh, Grinsick actually came up with the first um, angiography-derived coronary flow reserve. So they, they came up with uh, contrast medium appearance images. Um, and so they took coronary angiograms, and then I'll show you an example of this in the next uh, slide. They uh, made individual pixel contrast appearance um, uh, maps, and then they uh, essentially derived coronary flow uh, reserve based on the color coding. So here's an example. So if you look at this top panel, um, the uh, angiogram of the right coronary artery, it's red, and the key at the top tells you that this is the first frame, uh, or the phase, first cardiac cycle. The yellow is the second cardiac cycle. Uh, white is the third, green is fourth, and blue is fifth. And so basically, they would set a, a point, and they would say that, you know, if you look into the PL here, um, it took two frames at the resting image uh, to reach this PL. But then on the second one, with contrast-induced hyperemia, it took one frame, so now this is red. So the ratio, uh, or the coronary flow reserve, was two to one. Um, if you contrast that, uh, down here, you have a vessel that's uh, white at baseline, and then it stays white um, with the contrast-induced hyperemia, so that they would say that this is a coronary flow reserve um, that's reduced at one. And so based on this, they had an angi angiography-derived coronary flow reserve, uh, but uh, again, really limited um, by the technology at the time. If you, just to put this in perspective, this was 1984. Um, Windows 3.1 didn't come out until 1992, so this is really um, impressive for the uh, computational effort that went into it at the time. So then we get a little bit closer. So um, the Timmy frame count was derived in 1996. So uh, Dr. Gibson's uh, seminal paper uh, where they looked at the um, data for the um, thrombolysis uh, um, 
uh, Timmy 4 trial. Um, and so they uh, basically derived that if you take a, a coronary angiogram and you count the frame counts, um, when the contrast touches both walls of the vessels that you can start counting. So basically they made corrections for the length of each vessel for the um, LAD, RCA, uh, and the circumflex, and then they essentially said uh, what a standardized frame count is. So um, in a normal vessel where there's no pathology, um, a frame count of 15 to 27 was considered normal. And then as flow gets reduced, the, uh, the Timmy frame count um, would actually correlate, and that correlates much better than um, our assessment of Timmy flow grade. So now we have a quantification of what flow looks like in a vessel. So that really leads us to the theoretical basis for QCA. So for QCA, I want to make clear that there's uh, a number of assumptions that we have to make. So the first is that if a coronary uh, artery was a pipe, there were no branches and it was totally straight, there would be no pressure drop from the proximal coronary artery to the distal coronary artery. However, we know that's not true. And so what we have to model is what's the change in the pressure uh, uh, across a coronary artery if there is stenosis in the vessel? And then how is it affected by changes in flow? So the first thing that's done in the derivation of QCA is this um, reconstruction where you have this three-dimensional um, uh, QCA across the entire vessel. And so now you can actually model the diameter stenosis uh, in very high fidelity. Then you simulate flow and you have to take into account the change in the lumen of the vessel, but also side branches where you're going to have loss of flow. And so once you take both of these into account, you can derive uh, the pressure drop. And so you take the inlet <coughs> pressure, which is the mean arterial pressure or the coronary um, driving pressure at the uh, ostium of the vessel. And then you can uh, derive the distal pressure using uh, computational fluid dynamics and come up with uh, this FFR QCA. So this was published in 2014. Um, and I'll show you an example of, of what this looks like. So you have an angiogram here. You have the contours that were used for the QCA, and then you have a three-dimensional reconstruction with a stenosis that you see. So you see that on the angiogram, and now you have that modeled here. Um, and then if you compare this, uh, the 3D QCA um, to the, the FFR, the wire-based measurement, they're actually fairly similar. So now we'll move into validation. And so um, how do you take this concept, this theoretical framework that you have, uh, and uh, uh, take this to patient care? So the International Multicenter Favorite Pilot Study, um, published in 2016, looked at 84 vessels and 73 patients with intermediate coronary stenosis. They compared three models. And so the first is a fixed flow model. Um, and so, like I said before, uh, simulating this hyperemic flow velocity, how do you um, actually uh, take that to patients? So this fixed flow model assumed uh, a coronary flow of 0.35 meters per second, and that was based on previous studies. The contrast hyperemia um, flow model used contrast as the hyperemic agent, and then the adenosine hyperemia um, uh, model used ad intravenous adenosine. And so using these flow models, what we have to do is try to actually uh, uh, see how accurate we are against the fractional flow reserve that's measured with the wire. And so in this study, um, they showed that contrast hyperemia actually had uh, very close um, accuracy to a wire-based um, fractional flow reserve with intravenous adenosine, but didn't require a wire and didn't require adenosine. So this is uh, an example. This is the right coronary artery. The wire is here at the um, crux of the right. This is the wire-based assessment, the fractional flow reserve, and then you have your three models here. And so of these, the most practical model was selected as uh, the contrast hyperemia model. And so this then led to um, the QFR as we know it today. So in the initial studies, this was an offline assessment that um, took about 10 minutes. So Favor 2 China uh, looked at QFR versus fractional flow reserve, um, 308 patients, 328 vessels uh, at five centers in China. So this was really to look at the accuracy of QFR uh, as we know it now against um, fractional flow reserve. So if you look at the per vessel accuracy, the LED, the circ uh, circumflex, and the right coronary artery, um, these confidence intervals are very tight. Um, and then your accuracy estimates are actually uh, all above 90% um, with a, a decent number of uh, uh, patients. Then if you look at the per patient accuracy, um, the target value that was pre-specified for the study was 75%. And um, the uh, accuracy was actually well above that. And this is uh, the accuracy for determining um, FFR less than uh, uh, or equal to 0.8 or greater than 0.8. And so um, if you want to look at the value itself, the correlation uh, was also uh, pretty tight. And so um, an R of 0.85. Uh, so this all tells you that uh, QFR is uh, very close to FFR for decision making based on an FFR of um, uh, 0.8 or below being a, an ischemic lesion. And then the values actually uh, are very similar. Favor 2 Europe-Japan looked at QFR versus FFR 
um, in 292 patients, uh, 317 vessels at 11 centers in Europe and Japan. And this actually was the first time that you have um, in-lab uh, assessment. So the time to QFR was five minutes versus the time to FFR, including a guide, a wire anticoagulation, um, was seven minutes. There was no difference uh, in the um, uh, diagnostic ability when this was done inter procedure versus a core lab QFR measurement. And then the accuracy was actually very good for um, uh, FFR values at the very low end of the spectrum or at the very high end of the spectrum. And where you have uncertainty is this intermediate range. So this is where decisions matter, right? So this is where we take a binary decision and we say, this is a vessel that will treat or will defer. And so the accuracy was lowest in this, um, uh, in this range. So how do you reconcile that? You use outcome studies, and so that's what the next study was. So Favor 3 China was an outcome study looking at QFR versus angiography guided PCI. So how do you determine the treatment strategy? And this was a multicenter, blinded, randomized, sham controlled trial done at 26 hospitals with 3,825 patients. You compared uh, QFR guided uh, PCI to angiography P uh, guided PCI. And again, randomized, uh, randomized study that was sham controlled. So. Um, if you look at the percentage of uh, the primary outcome of major adverse cardiovascular events, the angiography guided group at one year had 8.8% MACE um, and uh, compared to 5.8% uh, MACE. And these were all stable patients who were presenting um, with suspected ischemic heart disease. If you look at the MACE components, MI was lower with QFR compared to, to angiography, repeat revascularization was lower, and uh, procedural MI was also lower. So this strongly uh, showed that um, QFR has an outcomes benefit against angiography. And these results were durable to two years. So this was a landmark analysis looking um, both at the 12-month 12, uh, 12 outcome and then uh, the subsequent study looked um, again at 24 months. This is an ongoing improvement in uh, outcomes for MACE. Interestingly, uh, the, uh, most of the events happened in patients where there was a change um, in treatment strategy. So 25% of the patients in the QFR group actually um, had a change where patients who uh, the pre-specified determination was that the patient would get P uh, PCI. After the QFR, PCI was deferred in 20% of those patients. Those are the patients who had the largest improvement in outcomes. So this really showed that QFR could improve clinical decision making when we uh, try to assess patients with intermediate severity stenosis. Favor 3 Europe Japan was Q, uh, QFR versus FFR guided PCI. This um, finished enrollment earlier this year, and uh, the results are um, pending for next year. This is um, a non inferiority trial looking at um, QFR versus FFR guided PCI uh, with one year uh, outcomes follow up. Most recently, the FIRE trial, um, which was uh, uh, presented to ESC, looked at physiology-guided uh, PCI in multivessel disease in older patients. Um, this is uh, really exciting that in clinical practice, 35% of patients uh, were QFR-guided in this trial. Um, and so it really shows uh, that this is a great tool that we can use. And this really it helped lead to this um, huge improvement in um, major adverse cardiovascular events uh, or the primary outcome. So in summary, QFR uh, has been studied in 17,000 patients. The overall accuracy for determining the FFR value of um, less, uh, less than or equal to 0.8 or greater than 0.8 is 94%. And it takes less than 60 seconds uh, for analysis in its current form. In conclusion, coronary angiography has been used for more than 70 years for the evaluation of coronary uh, anatomy. Physiology-guided revascularization and decision-making has been shown to improve long-term outcomes. And angiography-derived uh, physiology with QFR is comparable to wire-based methods and superior to angiography for uh, long-term outcomes. Thank you very much.